Mayor, congratulations on last night. Thank you. So a uh, big part of the conversation that's come out of this debate has been about race. You've been dealing with that in South Bend. As you know, the vice president is dealing with it. Kamala Harris is dealing with it. Do you think that this is the right time for the Democratic Party to be having that conversation? Absolutely, we have to. I I'm increasingly convinced that if we don't tackle racial inequality in my lifetime, then it is going to tear apart the American project in my lifetime. I think there was a sense at some point, maybe a naive sense, that if we just did away with racist policies and replaced them with neutral policies, then everything would get better on its own. I think what we're finding is that systemic racism is a lot more intractable than that. And for certainly all of us running for president, it's incumbent upon us to have an explanation of what we're going to do proactively and with intention to reverse racial inequity. And so it, it makes sense for it to be an issue that's front and center. Uh, you know, in many ways, this president put it front and center by practicing a, a kind of white identity politics out of the White House. And if that's what it took for some of these issues to get more prominence in the national spotlight than before, then uh, then at least that much is a healthy thing. You said if we don't deal with it, it's tear it'll, it'll tear us apart, right? Yeah. And that, do, do you think you came to that, have you, when did you come to that realization? Is this something that has it's been a new sort of awakening for you? Yeah, I think uh, as somebody who's not from a community of color but has wrangled with these issues in, uh, obviously, in the context of leading a diverse community and now in the context of presidential politics, uh, you learn every day. And frankly, I've had to learn a lot about this the hard way not in the same way that somebody who is impacted by racism personally does, but uh, as somebody who is trying to uh, hold together a community and, and model how our country can be held together at this time when race is being used very effectively by this White House to divide us, to divide people with shared interests, uh, but also at a moment when we could be reaching into our identities as a way to support one another. I, I think this is a moment when it's very important for uh, for men to be standing up for women, for straight people to be standing up for LGBTQ people, and frankly, for white people to be standing up for the concept that black lives matter and a lot of other questions of, of racial equity that just deserve more attention. So we're both gay. I'm, um, you know, a black man. And I've had to deal with these issues my entire life, right? People can't, didn't always know that I was gay. Now all of a sudden you're, you know, running for president and when you're at the, probably the peak of your career that you, you know, the highest that you've been so far, so far, all of a sudden these things have come, these two worlds are colliding. Gay, issues of diversity, issues of race. What have, what have you learned in this process? What has that process been like for you? Well, I think what, what I'm learning is that you can't and shouldn't run away from your identity. Uh, you also can't let it speak for you completely. Because what I'm finding is everybody has different kinds of experience. For example, even within the L LGBTQ world, right? Uh, I'm a married gay man. That doesn't give me that much insight in what it's like to be a trans woman of color at a moment when trans women of color are under attack. Um, but it, it gives me hopefully something I can tap into in terms of an awareness of what it's like to be on the wrong side of a pattern of exclusion, to be on the wrong side of a question of belonging. Why would people who are either black and or gay why should people feel that you can represent their interests if it took you so long to get there on both those issues? Look, I've sunk my teeth into these issues from day one. Uh, I was standing up against Mike Pence and the Religious Freedom Act back home before I was even out, uh, knowing that that would probably lead to some questions about you know, whether I was gay before I was ready to talk about it. Uh, I've done everything that I can to be on the right side of racial issues as well. There's a learning process, and one of the things I acknowledged uh, uh, yesterday is that uh, there's a process of delivering results on some of these issues. There are areas that I'm proud of, there's areas where we've come up short, and I've got to own that. Um, mm -hmm. But I've always been committed to this. So you said, uh, this is what you said uh, about uh, South Bend's police force, you say you couldn't get it done. So how are black Americans, and all Americans really, how can they trust that you'll get it done, issues of uh, race, and the tensions across this country if you become president, if you couldn't get it done in South Bend? Well, I don't think all of these issues are, are things that somebody can just claim to have solved. The issues that I haven't solved as a mayor are issues that America hasn't solved, that, that no city has solved, but where we've made progress. Sometimes it's three steps forward and two steps back. I'm not gonna present myself 
as the person who is going to resolve racial tension or racial inequality mm -hmm. in this country. That's not the story I'm telling. What I am saying is that we have addressed these issues in my community. We have learned from that. And I'm passionately committed to bringing about in my lifetime a world where uh, a black person and a white person pulled over by a police officer feels the exact same thing and that that's a feeling not of fear, but a feeling of safety. What exactly does I couldn't get it done mean? Specifically, what do you mean by that? I was asked about the uh, diversity of the South Bend police force. It's an example of an issue that we're wrestling with in South Bend and that a lot of cities are, are seeing. There is a gap in many diverse communities between the diversity of the community itself and did the diversity you mean, of the... Did you, mean, did you mean, I don't mean to cut you off, but did you mean I couldn't find qualified um, black officers or officers of color? I couldn't find a qualified chief of color? Or what does that mean you couldn't get it done? I couldn't get us to where the number of black officers on our department mirrors our community. And it's really important that that happen if we want to have the kind of trust mm -hmm. between communities of color and the department that we need. It's not for lack of effort, I can tell you that. We've taken a number of steps to try to recruit more people to apply in the first place, uh, to try to map out. Matter of fact, if you're watching, somebody's watching at home, they can go to the police transparency portal we set up in South Bend to push out our data. Uh, and you can actually see what's happened in different stages of the recruitment process as we're trying to figure out, okay, where do we lose applicants? Where do we lose good applicants of color? Did you, um, did you figure it out? Uh, that's what I'm saying. We haven't cracked the code on this, so, but we're learning. So then what, why did the department, do you have an idea of why the department became less diverse under well, you? Well, in simple terms, it's that we weren't able to recruit and bring on minority officers at the same rate that they were retiring and leaving the force. And again, this isn't only a South Bend problem, but I'm in charge in South Bend, so I accept the fact that we're not at our goals at home. So we've been talking specifically about South Bend. Then talk, talk to me about your plan for marginalized people especially people of color as president of the United States? Well, like I said earlier, we, we can't expect that if we just have neutral policies replacing racist policies and systems that have been in place for centuries. And not just in the context of, of police and yeah, criminal yeah, justice. Yeah, yeah, for sure, yeah. No, and for me, criminal justice is a huge part of it. Right? And we know mass incarceration, we know uh, policing issues need to be tackled. But I also don't want to sound like we're reducing the black experience in America to right. criminal justice. Right. I'm concerned about entrepreneurship. I'm excited about entrepreneurship. Uh, black entrepreneurship is where a lot of jobs and opportunities are being created. And the government could be more supportive of that through, through the purchasing that the federal government does and even through measures <clears throat> to co-invest in minority-owned businesses. You see that going on in Maryland. They use their pension fund for that. We could too. So entrepreneurship, home ownership, health, education, each of those areas could receive specific targeted action. We're, I'm calling it the Douglas Plan mm. uh, because it should be as ambitious as the Marshall Plan that mm. rebuilt Europe. America did that uh, to help Europe rebuild. What are we doing for black America knowing that black Americans have been systematically excluded from, from all those areas, justice, home ownership, entrepreneurship, and so on. And of course, in addition to those five areas, there's the basic question of democracy. It's not accidental that the various patterns of exclusion from uh, the ability to vote, even today, uh, the ways in which it's, it's made harder to vote, the ways in which people's voices are diminished by gerrymandering, have a very strong racial element to that. And yeah. the disempowerment of people of color is connected, I think, to the failure of policy to bring about racial equality in our time. Which is interesting because the Supreme Court just you know, made a, 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 a call or judgment on that, uh, on gerrymandering just yesterday. Let's talk about the debate. You stood on the stage uh, with the former vice president, with Kamala Harris, and you saw their back and forth. The, vice, the former vice president seemed to be you know, invoking states' rights when he talked about a busing uh, in this country. Is, is Vice President Joe Biden out of touch with today's Democratic Party? It, it certainly seemed like uh, some of what we heard there was just tone deaf to, uh, to the realities of, of lived experience right now. We need to be talking about these things differently. What was your reaction when, you, when, when, he, when that happened on stage? Well, of course, it was striking because uh, she was describing a personal experience that she had had. And, and I think there was a sense of uh, whether uh, good intention is enough. And that's something I'm always checking myself on, too. I'm, I'm convinced of my own good intentions. But um, black residents in, in my community, or for that matter, black activists around the country, aren't really just just interested in whether I've got good intentions. They want to know whether we're actually going to be able to deliver in our time. And I think that was some of the struggle that you
you saw playing out on stage? There seems to be the, this idea that that uh, Biden is the strongest candidate to beat Donald Trump. And when you when you actually look at it, um, Democrats who won, right, and these were younger Democrats at the time, Bill Clinton uh, was a fresh face. Uh, President Barack Obama was a fresh, different face. Al Gore did not win, right? He was someone who had been in office for a long time. John Kerry didn't win as well. Um, what do you think of this idea that, you know, it has to be an older white man who can beat Donald Trump? Yeah, I think the pattern you just described shows that possibly the riskiest thing we could do is to try to play it safe in that way. Think about this. My home state in Indiana. Uh, Indiana went blue once in the last 50 years. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't for Bill Clinton and it wasn't for John Kerry and it wasn't for Jimmy Carter. It was for Barack Obama. Now, if we were sitting here in late June 2007, saying, let's find somebody so electable, so palatable, uh, so easy for, for swing voters to get comfortable with that, that he could even carry Indiana for Democrats. I'm not sure a lot of people would have said the name of Barack Obama, but he was able to move people, he was able to inspire people. 